Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Legendary Ingredients Forging the Path in Esports. My name is Nick Taylor and today we'll be talking about the use of plant-based ingredients to support key gaming abilities in esports athletes and gamers. Our speakers are Francesco Rega, Marketing and Partnership Manager at Team Satire, Mike Hughes, Director of in Insights at FMCG Gurus, and Brenda Fonseca, Senior Global Technical Services Manager at Chemin Human Nutrition and Health. Just before we get started, I have some housekeeping items to go over. If you have any questions for our panel, please type them in the Q&A box below and hit the submit button. We will answer as many questions as time allows. Okay, with that cleared up, I will let's hand off to our first speaker. Francesco is an expert in esports and video games and is specialized in marketing and communications with a master's degree in digital marketing strategy. Francesco, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nick. I would like to start this uh, presentation on esports with a small comparison that may seem familiar to many of our um, listeners from South America or Europe. Um, I want to point out the differences between video games and esports. And to do that, I want to um, some, have a comparison between a football ball a soccer ball, depending on how you listen to this, and a football game, uh, it, the difference is the same. The video games are the instrument for the esports. The esports are the competition where players uh, challenge each other. In fact, I have here a, a small definition of esports. Esports are a form of video game competition between professional and underlying professional players and teams that can be based on single player or multiplayer games. More on the games in some of the slides after this. But I want to start uh, with a small history of esports because uh, many people would, may think that it's kind of recent. It's not. Esports uh, started uh, almost 40 years ago now with competition in Stanford. They evolved during time. And I want to point out particularly two, uh, um, okay, two events in this history, which is the one in 2000, with, uh, in which KESPA is founded in Korea. KESPA is a government organization, and it was the first one of its kind. And in Korea, uh, they uh, started very early to uh, check on eSports, to, um, to manage them, and to, um, to organize tournament players and having laws on that regard. The second one is Twitch in 2011. Uh, you may have heard of Twitch. Twitch is a big one. Twitch was founded in 2011 as a branch of Justin TV, but soon enough it became so popular they became its own company. And 2014 was bought by Amazon for almost one billion dollar. From there, it, it keep growing uh, till now, which is basically like a phenomenon uh, on the world, in on the market. Twitch uh, success is based from the fact that. Everyone can stream on Twitch. They can just have to set up their account, have a uh, Microsoft or camera, or even not even that. They just have to connect their PC and just show their uh, their games, how they play. Many people can follow these streamers because they like how they play, maybe because they are so good, or maybe because they are funny. There are many reasons. Um, we will speak about Twitch again uh, in the following slides. Now I want to point out uh, something about the games. As you can see on the slide right now, this is the top 15 esports in the world uh, made by the Sport Observer, a journal that I suggest you to follow if you are interested in esports. They are very, very good and professional. So in this uh, pyramid, I can there is like 15 esports based on their importance and the uh, the chart is based on a plethora of factors such as number of players, uh, number of tournaments, price pool, uh, etc. I want to point out two major things from this. Uh, the first one is that uh, four of these 15 games belong to Riot Games, which is a big, big developer. And um, they are owned by the Chinese Tencent, and they have that nev never this happened before that a single developer has four games in this uh, ranking. The second one is that seven out of 15 of these games are FPS, so first person shooters. Basically, games in which uh, one team try to kill the other with uh, shooting. So you may have heard of Call of Duty, maybe from one of your songs. Uh, that's one of the most famous, but there are a lot, as you can see. This is a small presentation that I made for another um, for my followers on LinkedIn, and it's based on League of Legends, the most popular sport in the world. These are some numbers from 2019, 
And you can see that the numbers are huge. There are literally like millions of people following the eSport and there are, they follow the legal agent for millions and millions of hours. Uh, on the bottom, you can see a chart of the regional leagues. And if this number doesn't seem very impressive, I calculated that the, the total of all the hours is 54,000 years. It's a stupid amount of hours, of course, but it kind of gives the idea of how big these uh, esports are. Uh, these are some of the best teams in the world. They are divided by uh, continent, but they are not necessarily stuck in their own continent. For example, Fnatic is based is an organization based in UK, but they compete in Germany for League of Legends, and they have a team in Southeast Asia for Dota 2. Uh, you may notice uh, that there is a section for Latin America. Latin America is a continent which is uh, growing up and um, with esports popularity, and there are some big brands like Flamingo that are investing in that. And uh, you may notice the blank space. It's because there is Team Satire in there, the, my organization, the big, uh, biggest organization in Europe. But jokes aside, we are a small organization, but we are growing up. Uh, the, uh, Team Satire was founded last year. Uh, I joined this year, the, the guys. And this is an image from one of the tournaments they participated in the one in Sevilla last year. On the right, you can see some of the pictures of our players and managers. And on the bottom, you can see the games in which we play, which is a big one. So teams, uh, the organization have different teams in different esports. Every organization may have one team, maybe, or five or 10, depending. Uh, it's general, in general, it's hard to sustain many esports organizations because it means a lot of players and people, but the most successful ones have like three or four and they focus their, uh, uh, their money and their skills in there. We are currently in PUBG, in CSGO, in FIFA, and soon in Valorant. This is a statement of our mission. We are creating a sustainable esports organization that has, uh, is athletes with physical and mental health. We want to focus on both, and we underline the word athletes, because right now, esports, esports are, um, players are athletes. Um, so, what makes esports attractive? Well, there is a strong competitive spirit at the very base. These players are competitive. They want to be the very best. They want to compete and to beat each other to, to gain the status of the best in the world. This is an image from season three world final in League of Legends at the very end with their own cup. Another uh, point is the superstar status. As you can see, there is a whole crowd cheering for these guys. There are thousands in the stadiums and in the arenas. Uh, last year, uh, uh, League of, uh, World uh, Final for League of Legends had more than 100 million for, uh, spectators, so more than Super Bowl. These guys fill arenas and they are really, really loved. The third one, as you can imagine, is good old fashioned money. These guys earn a lot of money. You can see the price pools, you can see some of the more famous contracts, but believe me, this is only the tip of the iceberg. These guys earn money in a lot of ways by sponsorship, partnership, streaming, and a lot more. And some of these players become so rich to, that they even found, uh, founded their own organization with their own players, G2 being one of the most famous examples in this area. So here I put some news, but there are just some of many brands that have decided to invest in the way or the other in esports. As you can see, there are very big brands, and these are just a couple of them. There are so many every day. You can see some of the biggest brands in the world invest in esports. In here, I wanted to point out some of the uh, celebrities that invested in, uh, in esports, or uh, the big brand like Samsung, or maybe Football Society like Schalke, or an NBA team like Cleveland Cavaliers or Golden State Warriors. They all invested in some uh, in their organization in esports. Uh, esports have this uh, appeal for uh, um, people that want to advertise or sponsor or participate in this because there are many big appointments and they are um, they are in the whole year. The, for example, the All Stars in League of Legends they were in February, while the uh, World Championship was in uh, November. So one that want to advertise for maybe a seasonal product or something, you can always find its own niche. Besides, they, these games have their own identity, of course. So maybe one brand can be more interested in one game or the other, apart from the numbers. So esports are changing. This amount of success and money are changing the the um, 
the scenario and many teams are investing in lifestyle coaches and in gaming houses where players can train and live together and some players have become so rich that they can even afford their own apartments and then go to the office like to work like anyone else um this is the first of four slides that i made for um the streaming services so as I told you, Twitch is basically the biggest one. It's basically like a monopoly on the streaming service. You can see some of the numbers here in the last 180 days, but they basically rule the market. Then we have YouTube. YouTube has tried to fight off um, Twitch on terms of streaming, but now they are a bit re retired in their own uh, things. So YouTube's are, uh, YouTube is famous to have like channels, like big channel of these streamers that maybe use, use it for highlights of their streaming on Twitch and uh, they mostly focus on streaming events and leaks, uh, not much on the individuals. Then there is Facebook. Facebook is was founded just a couple of years ago and they are growing, not as much as they would like. So they are, they are invested a lot in this. And as you can see in the bottom uh, of this slide, in an incredible twist in June, this June, Facebook united their um, their force with Microsoft with Mixer, which is was which was Microsoft uh, platform streaming platform, to fight against Twitch. Uh, Mixer was bought by Microsoft in 2016, as, uh, before the name was named Beam, and they tried a lot to fight off, even with multi-millionaire uh, investment like with Ninja down here, and but they failed sadly. As, as a last point that I want to point out is that. I spoke about players, tournament, developer. I didn't spoke about teams. So teams are an important cog in this and they are real influencer, big influencer, and they are worth of your interest and investment. As a matter of fact, we as Team Satire were interested and we are up to discuss about possibilities. So if you uh, want to contact us, you can contact me on the email as you have seen on the screen. And if you want more questions, to have more questions about eSports on the presentation or a similar, you can contact me on LinkedIn or on my personal email. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco, for that very interesting presentation. We will now move to Mike from FMCG Gurus. Mike has over 13 years experience analyzing consumer trends and has a particular interest in challenging industry perceptions about how consumers think and behave and identifying new trends across markets. As a reminder, if you have any questions for our panel, please type them in the Q&A box below. But with that, I'll hand over to you now, Mike. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Mike and I head up the research and insight division at FMCG Gurus. Today, I'm going to go through a project that FMCG Gurus conducted for Kemin last year, focusing on the growing e-gamers industry across Europe. We'll basically be looking at three parts. Firstly, we'll look at the health problems faced by e-gamers and related to this, what skills they deem important so that they can optimize their performance. We will then look at solutions and in particular, the opportunity that exists when it comes to nutritional supplements. And then finally, we will look at the opportunity that exists when it comes to plant-based ingredients. So firstly, the, the project. Over the period April to June 2019, FMCG Guru surveyed core gamers from five countries across Europe. A total of 250 were sampled per country. Now, to qualify, respondents had to be aged between 18 to 44 years old, played video games on a console, PC computer, or smartphone or laptop, and they had to play games for at least 15 hours in the average week. So we're not talking about casual gamers who might pick up a control for an hour or so after work. We're talking around dedicated core gamers. Moreover, these people also had to have engaged in activities such as creating gaming content, visiting events dedicated to gaming, or participating in multiplayer games online. So we're focusing on, again, people who take a real active interest. And one thing to take into consideration is that around 2% of consumers in Europe qualified for this criteria. If we apply that to the whole of Europe, it means there's around 50 million people in this segment and it's steadily growing. So it shows up there's a significant market. Now, e-gamers across Europe are suffering from a variety of health problems. The two main issues that they suffer from are a lack of energy and sleep health. 
We know that these are something that have a direct impact on alertness, concentration, and focus. We know like any consumer group as well in, in a COVID-19 environment, more consumers are more likely to be suffering from these problems. As such, this is something that will have a direct impact on gaming performance. Moreover, one in three gamers in Europe say that they have health issues directly related to their gaming activities. This shows that whilst e-gamers enjoy what they do, they do realize that there's consequences. And moreover, this is something that they'll want to address. The biggest problem experienced by gamers is memory stroke concentration concerns. And as we know, this will be something that's particularly problematic when it comes to playing strategy, action, multiplayer games where people have to be as focused as possible. Additionally, e-gamers also associate eye and cognitive health as crucial for gaming. When asked what abilities they think are critical for their best gaming performance, e-gamers were most likely to say on-screen visual processing speed, general energy levels, and reaction times. These are three areas that are ultimately interlinked. In addition to this, when asked what abilities they would like to maintain at their peak for gaming, they gave the, three, the same three responses, on-screen visual processing speed, reaction time, and general energy levels. And this shows that immediately, if there's products on the market that can help address these solutions, it will appeal to this growing segment. Now, currently, e-gamers are turning to products to help facilitate their performance, but they're more likely to be turning to products that are high in sugar, such as drinks with caffeine, or energy drinks. Um, we, we saw that earlier on in the presentation, a number of e-gamers say that they suffer from problems such as obesity and will be reluctant to turn to such products. It also shows that there's a growing opportunity to target consumers with alternative products, which are not only more efficacious because of a higher dosage, but also safer because they can offer reassurance around products being free from bad ingredients. Now, as we know, e-gamers are tech savvy. As such, it's no surprise that they're more likely to be aware of the dangers of blue light. Indeed, unaided, almost half of all gamers say that they have heard of blue light being transmitted from devices. This was significantly higher than other demographic groups surveyed in the project conducted for Kemin, such as students and office workers. Moreover, when given a definition, seven out of 10 said blue, blue light is a concern for them. So this shows that this is a genuine issue, which can be linked to the amount of time that they spend in front of screen. Positively, 76% of gamers said that they either use nutritional supplements to protect against blue light, or would be willing to do so, highlighting again the opportunity that exists for the nutritional supplement industry when it comes to the e-games market. Currently, only around half of consumers who say that they've heard of blue light are saying that they are taking steps to protect themselves and they're significantly more likely to be using screen filters than nutritional supplements. As a result of this, again, it shows the opportunity that exists in the market going forward. Now, in terms of the one quarter of e-gamers who said that they wouldn't be willing to use supplements to protect against blue light, the good news is that most of these respondents would be willing to change their mind if the influential factors can do can help them. When asked what it would take for them to consider using nutri nutritional supplements as part of a solution, e-gamers were most likely to say recommendations from family and friends. And I think this is something that's particularly important given that e-gaming networks can often be something of a community and shows the opportunity that exists when it comes to word of mouth brand ambassadors. Currently, only one in four gamers say that they currently use nutritional supplements. And related to this, three quarters of these have been using supplements for less than 12 months. This shows that most users will be new to the market. They may not be fully aware of the different products that are available, and they'll be willing to shop around for alternative products that they deem best meet their needs. The positive for the market is that 53% of gamers who use supplements say that they will continue to do so over the next 12 months. And this shows that these gamers believe that cap 
believe that nutritional supplements are effective with helping facilitate their gaming performance. When asked what formats they would like, e-gamers were most likely to say food stroke snack bars or capsules or tablets. The key to catching this consumer base is offering products that are not only efficacy, offer maximum efficacy, but are also convenient and can easily be incorporated into daily schedules. Alertness is a key reason for willing to use supplements. Our research shows that the most common reason for turning to supplements amongst the e-gaming community is because they were struggling to concentrate when playing games. This shows that these respondents were actively looking to solutions to help with their problems. And when it comes to benefits that they want from nu nutritional supplements, the second most popular answer is improving alertness. And this again shows that e-gamers are currently looking out on the market for products that can help with their concentration, their focus, and their alertness. And this is something that will only intensify as the market becomes more competitive. The good news, again, is that whilst only one in four e-gamers currently use nutritional supplements, 76% of all gamers say that they would be willing to do so to protect their vision, and 65% say that they would be doing would be willing to use supplements to improve their performance. When it comes to product features that are most influential, if it was to be a case of choosing nutritional supplements, the science behind the product is something that has the biggest influence on purchasing habits. E-gamers want reassurance that products have the right ingredients and offer maximum efficacy. Moreover, they also want reassurance that products will not offer any side effects. When it comes to ingredients to target the e-gaming community, the growing plant-based market is something that the industry should look to consider. And this is especially true in a COVID-19 environment. Indeed, FMCG Guru's research conducted across all consumer bases over the period April to July 2020 showed that one in four consumers are planning to increase their intake of plant-based food and drink in their diets as a result of COVID-19. The main reasons for this is that such ingredients are associated with being more nutritious, healthier, and also better for the environment, which is particularly important as consumers seek out products that they deem to be good for them and good for the earth. And this is a trend that the e-gaming industry can capitalize on, particularly as those willing to use supplements highlight the importance of products offering maximum efficacy from a health perspective, but also being safe. So to conclude, e-gamers account for a significant and growing proportion of society. They believe that their performance is being impacted by health problems, whilst also wanting to improve their cognitive health. Gamers are also aware and conscious of blue lights and are willing to take actions to address this. Most gamers indicate a willingness to use supplements to protect both their eyesight and improve their performance. Gamers who use supplements deem them effective and like to see them in a variety of formats. This shows that e-gamers recognize the benefits of, of such products. And finally, plant-based ingredients provide an opportunity for the e-gaming market. Thank you very much for listening to the presentation today. If anyone would like any more information on FMCG Gurus, we can, con can be contacted at any of the below. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, for that insightful presentation. Our final speaker, Brenda Fonseca, spent 20 years conducting neuroscience research and has served as a college faculty member in the psychological sciences for over a decade. Brenda, take it away. Thank you, Nick. I'm happy to be here and I've really enjoyed our two previous speakers. And I'm really excited to share today oh, two possible solutions from Kimmin on addressing those needs that we've heard about in the esports and gaming communities. As Nick said, I'm a senior technical service manager at Kimmin. Kimmin has been around for approximately 60 years now. We're a family owned company with a, a goal of improving the quality of life of individuals around the globe. As you can see from this slide, we are extremely globally focused uh, with facilities in um, more than 15 countries and operating in more than 90 countries. And today I wanna share with you two of our ingredients 
ingredients that really are, are specially designed to really address these needs that we've been hearing about in the gaming community. So let's get started with that. Um, as you heard from Mike's presentation, gamers are looking for some very specific skills in how to make sure that they improve their performance and maintain their health. So this is everything from improving their reaction times, maintaining their energy levels, and also their visual processing. They'd like to do all of this without having an impact on their sleep and without having the crash that maybe comes along with what you see with caffeine. So I wanna share some science today that provides you with two ingredients that can really address a lot of these main skills that gamers are looking for. So we're gonna start with one ingredient. That ingredient is called Numintix. So Numintix is, again, a plant-based ingredient, and you heard from Mike that this is something that individuals are really, really searching for. It's developed from a purpose-grown spearmint that's extracted using a water extraction, and it really was specifically bred to be very high in polyphenols, and specifically polyphenols that we know are excellent for brain health. So I'm gonna share a little bit about those polyphenols in the next slide with you. But after we developed uh, the plant, then we spent several years developing the clinical research. And what we found is that when you take Numentix on a daily basis, you have improvements in attention or focus along with working memory, and that you see these improvements without disrupting your sleep. So really very well aligned ingredient for what we're seeing in the gamer's needs. So let's talk a little bit about how we developed Numentix. Uh, this really is a pioneering process. We looked through over 5,000 different species of spearmint in order to find the spearmint that was naturally highest in these important polyphenols. Then we did natural breeding in order to develop two lines of spearmint that are patented that are rich in polyphenols. We then worked with the University of Parma in Italy to conduct uh, basically a phytochemical characterization of our extract. And we were able to identify that our extract contains over 50 polyphenol compounds. And some of the important ones that we talk about are rosemarinic acid, salvinolic acid A and B, and lithospermic acid, which have known benefits in the brain. Um, we have spent over $3 million developing this spearmint. We grow it ourselves uh, in the U.S. with partner farmers using good agricultural pro processes. We do have certified sustainably grown fields, and we're also non-GMO project verified. We've uh, fully understand the spearmint, and we have the entire sequence um, DNA sequenced as well. So as you can see, this is a plant that we have really spent a lot of energy developing and understanding and have a lot of control from the very beginning to the end of, of this plant and obtaining a very high quality source of the spearmint extract. When we look at those polyphenols are, that are in there, and based on our science as well as some science in the literature, we know that there's at least four ways that Numentix is acting in the brain. And you can see those four methods laid out here in this slide. So we know that they're polyphenols, so they're strong antioxidants. So you can see with that first mechanism, we know that they reduce oxidative stress. And we have several studies showing that they selectively reduce oxidative stress in the brain, especially in those areas that are important for the cognitive benefits that we talked about, so the hippocampus and the cortex. Uh, we also have been able to show that those molecules can increase neurotransmitter levels, in particular a uh, neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. Now this is a neurotransmitter that's incredibly imp important for learning and memory, so being able to improve that um, quickly is very important. Uh, we also have discovered that those, some of those polyphenols are able to actually promote the growth of new neurons in the brain. This is a process called neurogenesis, and we actually have a patent pending for our spearmint being able to actually produce new neurons. And then finally, we find uh, very neuroprotective uh, properties of these polyphenols to help protect and keep your healthy neurons healthy. 
So uh, what do we know on the science? We actually have 16 peer-reviewed scientific publications describing pneumatics and how it works and how it helps uh, individuals improve their cognitive performance. So we have five publications specifically of studies conducted in humans showing those benefits. And that's what you really want to see. That's the gold standard. We need to have the safety and the plant characteristics. You need to have the preclinical and mechanism of action studies. But in the end, you want to show that when you give this ingredient to people, you see those important benefits. So today I want to talk to you about two of those studies. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a study by Falcone, you can see in the left there, along with a study by Ostfeld. So let's start with the Ostfeld study, which was a very, very unique uh, type of study. And let me explain what we saw in that study. So this was a study actually conducted in an elite force of a military unit um, on active duty. So a very, very unique research design. You probably won't see another study like this. Um, and so it gave us a very special opportunity to see what kind of impact pneumatics would have on this group of people who are really at the top of their game. And if we think about this and how it relates to gamers, there's a lot of similarities, obviously, obviously especially when you look at those first person shooter games, as Francesco mentioned. Uh, so this is a a screenshot from Call of Duty and you know that having that kind of uh, expertise that you get from that elite military force as well as those skills that help the elite military force succeed may translate then into the gamers reality and in fact a gaming organization just recently hired on several uh, elite military vets to help train their team so certainly something extremely relevant to that gamer community um, what we did in this study it was a double blind randomized controlled human clinical, so very nicely designed. Uh, half the group got a placebo and half the group got pneumatics. No one knew who was taking what. It was a small sample size, so we had 10 individuals, and that's because of the uniqueness of this scenario. Um, they started uh, taking the um, supplementation. We did some baseline testing. They supplemented for 16 days while they were doing active drills and on active, uh, active patrol. And then finally, on the last day, day 16, they actually went out on a high-risk operation, which required the uh, troops to actually stay awake for 24 hours. Immediately upon returning, they were tested again, and then we were able to really see uh, what kind of impact pneumatics might have in this type of scenario. Again, these were adult men. You can see some of the criteria down below, as well as some of the testing that we did. We were super excited about the results. So let me show with you what we actually saw when we brought them back in and tested them. So here we have reactive agility reaction time. So this was a task where they had to react in a physical manner uh, and, and perform a task. And what we have here, as you can see on the left, this is the group that was taking placebo. Each line represents one of the individuals in the study. And we start with the first data point at the baseline and then the last data point uh, after that high risk operation. So you can see the way the line goes, that shows how that individual changed. So this is reaction time so you want it to decrease you want people to be faster so some of the people did get faster um, throughout in the placebo group but not everyone but here if we look at the pneumatics group you can see that every single individual improved so if this is after being awake for 24 hours they actually had a greater reaction time when they came back in and were tested there was also a scenario where they had to identify a target. They had to perform a physical task and then have a go, no go shooting situation. And you can see in the placebo group, everyone did it well at the baseline, but then there was a significant uh, decrease in performance when they came back. But in the pneumatics group, you can see uh, not everyone performed it 100% at the baseline, but when they all came back, everyone in that pneumatics group performed it perfectly. So we might also be asking, if you think back to Mike's uh, presentation, that people really want energy, that they really want to maintain that energy level and that helps them with their focus and alertness. So we also asked a questionnaire to each of the individuals in this study about their energy levels. And you can see the questions that were asked and they had to rate where they were on these scales. So again, the same type of scenario here, you can see that when we looked at energy levels in the placebo group, a lot of people went down, they were kind of all over the place. But in the pneumatics group, almost everyone had higher energy after this high risk operation where they were awake for 24 hours. And based on a magnitude based inferences analysis, 
practice, we saw that energy, focus, and alertness were all likely improved in that group that took Numentix compared to that group that took placebo. So these are people at the top, top of their game, and we're seeing improvements in these areas that we are mentioning, energy, focus, alertness, that's exactly what the gamers are looking for. So we also wanted to uh, replicate this study in a larger group of individuals. Obviously, 10 people in this very unique situation is super exciting for us, but we also like to look at larger uh, groups of people as well. So we conducted another study in 142 healthy, recreationally active young men and women. So the average age of this group was around 30 years of age. They supplemented with either placebo or pneumatics for 90 days. Again, this was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study. They either took the 900 milligrams of pneumatics or placebo, and we used two tools. One was a cognitive assessment tool called CNS Vital Signs, and then the other one is this video that you see down here a device called the Makoto Arena device. So as you can see, this requires you to react to a light and a sound, a tone, and you have to hit it either with your hands or your feet, uh, depending on where the light is, and you're judged on how many hits you get and how fast you can complete this task. And so again, very similar to what we are looking at in that Leap Force. We're looking at reaction time, and we also assessed focus, or what we call in the study, sustained attention. So first, let's look at that reactive agility. So in this graph, these are the days of testing. So day zero, day seven, day 30, and day 90. And the blue lines represent the people that were taking placebo, and the orange lines represent the people who were taking Numentix. And you can see that when you look at the number of hits, so that's how many times they were able to hit that light within 30 seconds, the people taking Numentix showed significant improvements at that one month mark, and that improvement was maintained throughout the duration of the study. And that's what you want to see when you're looking at cognitive ingredients. Sometimes you can see short-term benefits, but those improvements are not maintained. And that shows that we're really making positive changes um, in cognitive performance and brain health, that we see that change all the way through the duration of the study. The same thing here with the reaction time, and we already saw improvements in reaction time in several of these within seven days, and you can see the statistical significance that the pneumatics group is not only getting more hits, but they're reacting faster, and again, that was maintained throughout the course of the study. So really exciting and helped us really support what we saw with that Elite Four study. Um, the other thing we looked at was focus. So this is a, a test that's called sustained attention, and basically it requires you to stay on task and not be distracted for a, a, a longer duration of time. And here again, the blue represents the people taking Numentix, and the yellow represents the individuals taking placebo. You can already see by day seven, the people taking Numentix are significantly improved and versus those that were taking placebo. By day 30, we have that statistical significance, and again, maintained throughout that three-month duration of the study. In fact, we had an 11% improvement in focus compared to that placebo group. And just for comparison, a similar study that was done with 60 milligrams of caffeine was able to show a 6% improvement in a similar type of test. So we're seeing something really meaningful. People see and feel those improvements that they get with caffeine, but here we don't require caffeine. There's no crash. It's not disrupting your sleep, yet you're having that improved focus and, and, um, and sustained attention. So for Numentix, our clinical science really shows improvements in focus, attention, that reactive agility, that physical performance, and we're not disrupting sleep. So these are things that we know from the consumer research we've already heard about, that these are things that gamers are looking for. So we go back to that question, you know, what are gamers looking for? We see some of those that are addressed here. But there's a few more that we also want to address. And so obviously it's nice to think about combinations of ingredients that can really hit as many of those key areas as possible. So things like visual processing, eye protection, and some of the memory improvements we actually have seen in a second ingredient that we produce here at Kimmin. So that's called fluoroglow lutein. So we really are the pioneers of lutein. We brought lutein into the, the market and we grew the science with lutein and we really have formed this revolution about lutein and zeaxanthin and the role of these ingredients in the eye and and now understanding the role of the, the lutein in the brain as well. So we have really revolutionized the supplemental lutein market and we're very proud of what we've done with fluoroglow lutein. 
If you're not familiar with Floraglow lutein, it is the world's first branded lutein. Lutein is an ingredient that's found in our diet. Our body cannot make lutein. We must get it from an external source, either a diet or a supplement. It's found in a lot of those nice green leafy vegetables, as well as eggs and corn. And what happens is it's actually a pigment and it's deposited in the back of your eye. And that protects the back of your eye where those photoreceptors are from oxidative stress, as well as blue light. And now more recent studies have shown that it's actually deposited throughout the brain. The level in the eye directly correlates with the level of the brain. So if we can figure out how much lutein is in the eye, we also know how much is in the brain. There's actually a non-invasive way that we can do a simple eye test to figure out how much lutein is deposited in the eye, and it's called looking at the macular pigment optical density. Sometimes that's abbreviated as MPOD. So I'm going to show you some of those results, so I'll let you understand what that is, and that's basically telling you how much lutein you have in your eye. As I mentioned before, Floraglow lutein is the trusted source of lutein. We have really revolutionized the supplemental lutein market with our Floraglow lutein. And so some of the ways you can visualize that is that fact that we have over 90 human clinical publications with Floraglow lutein. And in fact, in the most recent years, we have had nine human clinical publications on cognition alone. She's really showing that we are still leading the science and really pushing the boundaries of what we understand about lutein. Uh, we also, as you can see, are very well established for lutein as blue light protection. So we have been able to show in over 70 human clinical publications that when you supplement with Floraglow lutein, you can improve the amount of lutein that is deposited in your eye. And that's assessed through that MPOD that we discussed earlier. And in fact, we are the author of a patent showing how lutein naturally protects those vulnerable eyes from blue light. And then finally, we're an incredibly safe ingredient. So as you can see in this bottom row here, we are the, um, the only brand that's been approved in the U.S. for grass use, for infant nutrition, and even for preterm infant nutrition. And we also are the only lutein brand that's been backed by 15 human clinical publications in both maternal and infant nutrition. So just a very oh, well-established brand, the pioneer in lutein and really setting the bar for anyone else. And in fact, as I mentioned, we have nine clinical publish studies that have been published in just the last few years showing that lutein, fluoroglow lutein supplementation improves cognitive performance uh, and visual processing speed. So let me show you. I have two studies here that I want to point out to share with you about what we've seen in the science behind fluoroglow lutein. So one study uh, was done in 51 young, healthy men and women. So these were individuals between the ages of 18 and 30. It was a 12-month study, and they were supplemented, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled. So they were either supplemented with 10 milligrams fluoroglow lutein and 2 milligrams OptiSharp zeaxanthin, or the other group was given placebo. And what we did after a year of the study, one MPOD was measured and it was shown that definitely their lutein levels in their eyes increased. But also if you look here, some amazing results when it comes to cognition. So this is a task called spatial memory. So this is basically uh, remembering where objects are in space that you see visually. So if you think about a gaming situation, this is 100% spot on when you're watching a gaming situation, remembering where things are, coming back to them, that whole visual memory, the individuals taking the lutein and the um, zeaxanthin were scored two times better than the individuals taking placebo. So extremely specific results when it comes to visual and spatial memory. Um, and then we also have another study that's incredibly exciting. And this looked at an area of visual uh, processing called coincidence anticipation timing. So on this one, what you need to do, and we have an example here to show you, is you need to line up where an object is in space and basically press a button at the right time so you can, in this situation, hit um, hit the target. Or in the testing situation, it was a line of LED lights and you had to press the button when the LED light got to the end of the row. So uh, very, very relevant to what gamers are trying to do. Um, what was found in this clinical study was, again, young, healthy adults between the ages of 18 and 32. And uh, 
uh, again, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study. You can see from the results that the individuals that were in the treatment group scored 20% better in their improvement on this coincidence anticip anticipation uh, about variable. And this was at the speed of 20 miles an hour. So again, you can see here that the treatment group was much, much better and much more improved of, over the duration of this study. So when we look at uh, fluoroglobulin and what it can do in young, healthy adults, for one, we need to acknowledge that there's, uh, as we said, over 70 studies showing that when you take fluoroglobulin, it gets deposited in the back of the eye, and that's an indication of protection from blue light, but also an indication of lutein deposition in the brain and all those benefits that come along with it. And as I mentioned, some of those include that visual anticipation timing, incredibly relevant for the gamers, contrast sensitivity. So these are studies we weren't even able to get into today, but basically being able to see a contrast on a screen, like a white golf ball in the sky, that contrast sensitivity improves. You are able to actually have a reduction in glare. Uh, glare is something that is a very, uh, could be a major problem, especially if you're thinking about a gaming situation. Um, photo stress recovery also improves. So that's how quickly your eyes can improve from a bright light. Again, incredibly relevant. And then finally, that blue light protection. So fluoroglobulin really offers a wide range of benefits that we can see in the gamer situation. And in fact, we have a, a concept here to uh, help you realize some of those benefits that you would see. This is a concept called speed run. It's a combination of Numentix and fluoroglobulin. You can see that it has those benefits, those, those kinds of benefits that, that the gamer is looking for and, uh, and really can uh, apply very nicely to the needs that they're looking for and really benefit that, that community. So I'd like to thank you for listening to, uh, to my presentation. Again, uh, we're happy to take questions. And if you would like to reach out directly, feel free. I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that way as well. Thank you, Brenda, for that great presentation. We would like to inform our audience about the upcoming webinar on Kemin's Innovation Series on November 3rd. With that, it is time to turn to the question and answer portion of today's webinar. Just to remind everyone, please feel free to type any questions you have into the Q&A box below. Our speakers would love to hear from you and answer any queries you may have. Our first question is for Brenda. So Brenda, are the ingredients water soluble and are there any taste or odor concerns? Thanks, yep, great question. Um, and actually both of the ingredients are water soluble. Um, Floriglo lutein is actually with, a, along with our partner DSM, uh, it is an, a, in a, a format called Actalise technology, which allows it to be in, uh, very nicely dispersed in water um, we know that that technology also adds to the bioavailability as well as the stability. So really nice water um, dispersibility of fluoroglobulin. And Numentix itself, as I mentioned uh, earlier, is a water extract. Um, is very nicely soluble in water and has great stability in different formats, such as shots and, um, and juices. And we know both of them work quite well in bars as well as um, some of those more traditional uh, formats, such as capsules, tablets, gummies, effervescence. So a lot of nice format application possibilities, and both of them are very nicely water soluble. So thanks for that question. Thanks, Brenda. Um, and then Francesco, are all video games capable of being esports? Well, uh, thanks, Nick. Uh, the answer in short is yes, but also no. Uh, so basically to have an eSport, you need a competitive video game. Uh, generally, that means that you have to have like a video game which uh, with a PvP component, so a players, player versus player component. Single player games may have some form of following, but generally they uh, go around basically uh, record beating and while they have some following, some audience for that, is that, that does not make an eSport. So to make an eSport, you, you, you need that type of game, a player at, at play a game that has at least like a component of player versus player. You need a significant number of uh, player base, 
a dedicated, a dedicated fan base and of course some form of audience. Uh, at some point, if the game is successful, there it will generate competition similar in a similar way to traditional sports. Uh, generally, then there is a gradual increase uh, in, uh, in people interested in that, and that brings people to organize tournaments, events, and similar that in then uh, grants uh, uh, sparks interest in, uh, in the audience on Twitch and other platform. That then brings all the rest with the sponsor, the attention from the media, etc. At that point, you may consider that like a successful esport. So, in short, yes and no. There are space of similar cases. Okay, thank you for clearing that up. Um, and then, Mike, um, do you think nutri nutritional supplements targeted at e gamers should be ingredient led or claims led from a positioning perspective? Uh, I, I thank you, Nick. It's a great question. And what I would say is it's a combination of both. Um, we know that when it comes to gamers, they tend to be more savvy when evaluating products and looking at health issues and health concerns compared to the, the average consumer. For instance, when we conducted this survey with Kemin, um, e-gamers were more switched on around things such as blue light and the dangers of um, looking at screen for too long. So I do think ingredient claims are going to be more influential for them compared to the average consumer that said i still think it tends to be more claim orientated where that's more influential you know uh, e-gamers like any other consumer when choosing a product will spend you know 10 to 20 seconds evaluating a product they'll look at things such as price as well whether it's a respected brand uh whether the product can be easily incorporated into their daily routines and as we saw from the research, they um, want these supplements not necessarily to have certain ingredients and nutrients in their bodies, but because they want it to directly enhance their gaming ability, be it from an eyesight or a cognitive perspective. And as a result of that, as a result of that, I think it needs to be very much claim led where this product can do this, this product can help you with this, etc. cetera. Um, at the same time, if you can have scientific claims to back up this or any other form of brand ambassador endorsement so that it's not just seen as you know kind of marketing claims and it's seen as as, as credible and transparent as possible uh that will help as well so so do focus on the ingredients mention the ingredients but ultimately lead with claims and make sure they're backed up with um with with science thanks mike um our next question then is a two-parter for brenda so firstly, Brenda, you mentioned that Numintix doesn't disrupt sleep. Um, could you expand on that and explain? And then secondly, do you recommend taking 900 milligrams of Numintix once daily, or would you get the same results by taking 450 milligrams twice a day? Great, okay, thanks. Yeah, and um, the disruption of the sleep was a really important concern for us. Uh, early on in our research program, it's something that we looked at. There are a lot of cognitive ingredients out there that act as stimulants and we know that they disrupt sleep. And so, um, so we wanted to ensure that this was not something that was going to get in the way of sleep. That's very counterproductive when we think about cognitive performance. We know how important sleep is uh, to actually perform well during the day. And so this was something that we, uh, we wanted to assess very early on. So in a study that I didn't talk about, a uh, publication by Herlinger et al., um, we did assess sleep. So we used a, a subjective sleep questionnaire called the Lead Sleep Evaluation Questionnaire. And we asked people at the beginning and at the end about their sleep quality and some of the aspects of sleep. And what we found was actually quite surprising for us um, was that the individuals who were taking Numintix by the end of the 90 day study actually reported that they were able to get to sleep better at night. So, um, so for us, that was confirmation that this is not something that is going to disrupt or interfere with your sleep, which we were really happy to see. Um, this was also surprising because they were taking this in the morning. Um, as we mentioned, there's multiple mechanisms going on. And so we feel there's probably several things helping to drive the fact that it's not disruptive and also uh, possibly helping people uh, fall asleep faster. Some of that can be the antioxidant benefits or some of those longer term benefits that we see with those polyphenols in our spearmint extract. So uh, given that, you're asked whether or not you should take the one dose in the morning or split it between two doses. 
is our clinical studies have been done with one dose given in the, at the beginning of the day. So 900 milligrams is our recommended efficacious dose. Um, and that's where we've conducted all of our clinical studies. Uh, given that, um, we do have customers who have launched uh, and divided it up between two doses. So that's up to the individual company. And we know based on some of those mechanisms that those mechanisms are longer term. And so they uh, theoretically should still work uh, being divided up versus being uh, given at one time. So I hope that kind of addresses the question there. Yes, that addressed both of them perfectly. Thank you for that. Um, yep. And then, um, Francesco, then, um, how can you approach teams? Well, uh, there are multiple ways to approach teams. So generally, you can catch them already from their official page. They don't have, generally have a large customer service, so you may probably catch them like an own individual that will happily answer you. Uh, don't be afraid to, to reach them at the info.team.com, uh, generally, uh, at team.com, uh, like to our email, if you want. Um, alternatively, the industry is very active on the social media, so you may want to reach them there. Um, or maybe you can, well, not in this period, but you may want to catch them at some fair or maybe at some tournament. You know, you, there are a lot of dedicated events for this stuff that, where you can surely meet like a CEO or a manager or a social media executive or something like that. Um, maybe it's a bit different for the top 10 teams in the world or the biggest team in general. They are a little bit more, it's a little bit more elaborated to reach them. But then again, you will most likely can get them via uh, social media or email uh, once you explain basically what is your purpose. Okay, great. Thanks for unpacking that. Um, and then, Mike, um, how can the industry convince e-gamers about the efficacy and benefits of their products? Yeah, thanks. It's uh, it's another great question and something that we um, touched upon with an earlier answer regarding um, how you make products as, as credible as possible. Um, the one thing I would say with uh, the gaming community is, as I said, it's, it's a very close-knit community where things such as social media influencers um other people within the community can act as influence so one have the scientific claims have those backed up show the clinical research even if it's not on packaging then you know look at incentives such as like having qr codes on the packaging or a link to the website where you can find out more of this information and then also if you work closely with with um people within the community and get them to endorse and to recommend the product that's something that will um enhance the credibility of of these products Great, thanks for that, Mike. Um, and then, Brenda, is the concept only applicable to esports, or are there other platforms that um, this could be extended to? Yep, thanks. Yeah, and, and also a nice question. Um, if we think about what we know that these ingredients are doing as far as cognitive performance and brain health and eye health, clearly this is uh, applicable to more than just the esports. Uh, it fits in line, aligns really nicely with the esports, but really any group that's looking to improve their focus, protect their eyes, improve their reaction time or visual processing speed. Uh, so this is everything from business professionals to people, uh, you know, active adults, working, uh, working moms, uh, older demographics that clearly want to uh, stay on top of their game. Um, and Flora Glolutin also has some really exciting research in children. Uh, so some really nice uh, potential aspects and applications there as well. So it really can be applied to quite a few different platforms or demographics and really has uh, relevant outcomes uh, for those groups, as well as even traditional athletes. So nice options. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for that. And then, um, Francesco, um, where do mobile games fit into this landscape? And what about um, VR and AR? Yeah, that's a pretty actual question. So starting from the last part, uh, well, VR and AR right now are not really a thing into esports. So there are some games. Many people will know at least like games like Pokemon Go. I, I think that at least like you heard of that. But as I said before, uh, esports are not uh, so basically those games are not ready in their essence to the, the esports the competition for many reasons. 
About mobile, the situation is a bit different. Mobile gaming is growing a lot in terms of revenue, in terms of attention. That brought, of course, attention by the audience and then consequently about uh, the, the societies and the companies that may want to advertise. So there are some exceptions, like, for example, maybe you heard about Clash of Clans or Clash Royale. They are from the same company that, by the way, got fined a million dollars just the other day. Uh, and so they represent an exception in the landscape, but most of the games are still, the esports are still on uh, PC and some of them on PlayStation uh, slash Xbox on console, basically. So to answer in short, there is some in uh, mobile and there is basically none in AR and VR. Okay, thanks for that, Francesco. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time for today's webinar. Um, if we didn't get around to your question, uh, we'll send you an answer by email in the next few days. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers for being with us today and to remind you at home that this webinar will be available on demand for the next three months. Thank you for being with us today and goodbye. Thanks.